to go ahead and introduce our speaker today. Our speaker today is Tamara Kling. She is CT's Government Relations and Regional Attorney. Thank you. Hello, my name is Tamara Kling and I wanted to welcome everyone to our presentation. Today we're gonna to talk about uh, business compliance and government governance essentials. This is really worth many, many hours of attention and I've tried to bring it down to an hour. There's more material here than we will have time to cover, but it'll just give you an idea of what's going on in the compliance and governance world. I know sometimes people have questions after the fact. I am in the Chicago office, and if you have any questions, if you wanna follow up with me, my number is 800-475-1212. Once again, Tamara Kling, 800-475-1212, or you can contact me through your, CP, your CT representative. So this is an overview. These are kind of some of the things we're going to talk about. All businesses have to engage in some sort of compliance, maybe a little, it may be a lot. But due to the past financial and accounting scandals, it has gotten more important and, and more people are being held accountable. You know, in the past, the governing bodies of corporations were criticized for permitting, committing, or failing to prevent non-compliant acts. And this is a broad topic. We're going to talk about corporations and LLCs, what the state laws require them to do, and government issues that are of concern to us now. So I'd like you to join in on our Q&A. Question, polling question one, there is a single definition of compliance. And uh, while well, the attendees, please remember that you have to answer these uh, questions for CLE accreditation. So please fill in your answer. Thank you so much. Do you think I can go to the polling results now, Victor? Let's yeah, hope no, so. Yeah. Okay. Um, most people said false, and I think that's because you're a good test taker. Usually, always, never, so, you know, it's usually a, a no to that. So here we go. This is um, the definition of compliance. Um, our focus, as again I said, we're going to be on the business and corporation acts. The, the business acts themselves have requirements. We'll talk about that. And business requirements are what we are expert at at CT. Um, and sometimes they don't deserve the attention that they really should have because they're that important. And um, as I said, compliance is becoming more important to corporations and becoming kind of a make or break thing. There's a lot of filing and reporting requirements to keep up with. Um, and also obligations for internal documents that the company or the LLC keeps. So we're going to talk about the state, corporation, and LLC acts. They're considered enabling acts, which means that they are allowing these business entities to form, and what they can do is, is their choice. There's various compliance requirements. Um, and today I'll focus on such things as the end report, franchise taxes, registered agent, uh, everything you see here is something that we're going to talk about today because it's important from the enabling statutes. So the annual report, uh, most states have an annual report for corporations and LLCs, both domestic and foreign qualified. A few states may have a different term for it, such as annual or some states like Iowa have a biennial report. They have different titles, but the filing is pretty much the same. And what they want to know is that what you put on your, your formation or qualification document, those requirements, they want to make sure they're the same, or if they've changed, they want to know what those changes are. Um, and there's some basics. Um, the main function, of course, is to provide anyone that could be harmed or seeking to invest in the company, government agencies, how they can find and locate and communicate with the business entities, whether they're foreign or domestic. 
Um, the statutes usually have a minimum required content, and it's not always that much. Um, there's also the administrators. They can have content requirements. And oftentimes it's related to the franchise tax. For, for instance, in Delaware, the annual franchise tax come due. Um, some states have it due at a certain date every year. Others, it's on an anniversary date, such as uh, the month of incorporation or qualification. And it varies, too, whether the states take these by electronic or paper delivery. Most are going toward electronic, but don't assume everyone is there yet. Um, why is compliance important? Well, in this case, if you don't file your annual report, there can be penalties and late fees when you do file it. If you continue not to file it, the corporation or entity will no longer be in good standing. Um, that means that they cannot get documents they need and they cannot file documents. Once they're, they can be administratively dissolved, their, their status as a foreign entity can be revoked. They can lose name rights, which are very important to companies. Um, they can't sue in state court, and even individuals can be personally liable for the responsibilities of the business entity. So there's a lot of good reasons to file your annual report. So a franchise tax, what would you say? It's a tax on a corporation's what? And I'm going to go on, see what the results are. I'm waiting with beta. Yeah, well. it doesn't look like the to... polling camera. The polling question didn't get pushed to the attendees, so I repushed it for you. So if you can just give them just a few seconds longer okay. to answer that question. And again, if you'd like to receive CLE credit for this webinar, please uh, enter your answer in here. And okay. Well, I've got the answers. And it is um, a franchise tax. It's a tax generally on the income and assets of a corporation. Um, locations, there may be real estate taxes to pay, but that's not generally regarded as part of the franchise tax. So the correct answer was A and B only. So it's a privilege for the right to do business in a state. You don't even have to have any income to owe a franchise tax. It's generally based on authorized shares or the net income. And for LLCs, it's typically a flat fee. Um, in some states, they will base it on members or capital accounts or something else. It's not a tax on income. As I mentioned, you can be making no money and you still owe a franchise tax. It's usually in the business entity statutes rather than the tax code. There's also a requirement when you form your corporation or whenever you make any changes that you have a registered agent whose purpose is to receive service of process. So it's a streamlined entity. Um, in some states you can also, there's, there's no limit. I mean, every state law has a different requirement for service of process, whether it has to be hand-delivered to an officer or it can be mailed to the Secretary of State. But all states, regardless of how their process work, have a requirement that the corporation or LLC have an agent to receive process. Um, so you have to maintain an agent, and you have to notify the filing office if you have any changes with that agent. Also, in some states, these the registered agent, they have to sign off on it. Some states are particularly aware that former anyone who forms a corporation or LLC may not know what a registered agent is and just put in any address. So compliance is important with this. First of all, um, failure can result in dismissal of the corporation. They can be dissolved or revoked. Um, also, there's the risk of a default judgment. And what, if, what happens if you do not receive proper service and the plaintiff who is serving you goes to court, shows they did everything right to effectuate service, and they get what's called a default judgment. And there's some case laws that look at this, um, this requirement, whether it's excusable neglect or why the corporation wasn't originally there to defend themselves. Now, courts 
don't really like default judgments. They like to hear cases on the merits. But sometimes it's egregious or comes to the point where the court is willing to say the default judgment is enforced. And another issue is when you don't have a registered agent or you don't properly get your process, you may not know this is happening until there's some kind of motion to discover assets or your bank accounts are, are in jeopardy. These are some of the cases that represent this. Um, it was called Sierra Corral Homes LLC. There were two members to the LLC, and one of the members accepted the appointment as the registered agent. Um, this person stopped being a member, and his duty before he entered his membership was to change the document on file with the state appointing a new agent, but he didn't do that. Most people, if they're quitting a, an LLC or corporation, they don't live up to those kind of duties. On the other hand, the plaintiff did have a lawsuit against that LLC, and he went to the state records, found out who the registered agent was, but this registered agent no longer considered him himself a registered agent, so they, they couldn't be located. Then the plaintiff made service on the Secretary of State. Well, a default judgment was rendered against the LLC, and the LLC tried to have that judgment vacated. The appellate court, what they chose to do is they upheld the trial court's denial of their motion to open the default, noting that the LLC offered what they called no reasonable expectation explanation for failure to maintain an agent. So this was just con considered to be too far. In other cases, the penalties aren't so bad. Here we have uh, Arch versus Wood Protection, and their flaw was proper, uh, the plaintiff sent proper service to the LLC, um, but the LLC had changed, the um, registered agent had changed its address twice, and the LLC failed to update its records, so process came back. The plaintiff tried to serve several more times and was unsuccessful. Finally, they went to court and they had a default judgment granted. Um, the court ruling, the district court said the, the, the defendant LLC tried to set aside the default judgment and the court was willing to set aside that judgment and, and hear the case on the merits. Um, only on the condition, however, that that LLC that had been so hard to find um, absorbed the expenses incurred by the plaintiff when they were trying to serve process. So their, their information was wrong at the Secretary of State's office, and it would be unfair for the plaintiff to bear the burden of trying to find them. Here's another case law that I'll go through. Um, the plaintiff filed an action against their employer, claiming that they were harassed by the owner and CIO. Um, who also was their registered agent. Um, after seven unsuccessful attempts to serve that agent, the plaintiff served what's called the corporation's division. Um, no response from the defendant, so the plaintiff filed for default judgment. At that time, the LLC moved to dismiss the case, saying that there was insufficient service of process. Well, the court denied this motion. They noted that the D.C. law permits service on the corporation's division where a registered agent can't be reasonably or with due diligence found, which was the case here. Um, they said the plaintiff showed reasonable diligence, and the evidence all suggested that the registered agent, who was a defendant also, was dodging process, the process server. Um, so the moral of this is we say not only do entities need to appoint a registered agent, they need to appoint a competent and professional one. You just don't want anybody getting your service a process and then doing with it what they think is best for you. So next I'm going to talk about foreign entities. And what do you think? A foreign entity is organized in a country other than the U.S. Um, it's in a state other than the state of formation or both. And just to let everyone know, this is a polling question, a CLE polling question. You do need to answer this polling question in order to receive your credit. 
you're not able to answer it on the slide deck, please type your answer in the Q&A box in the lower left-hand corner. Uh, I moved to the wrong, hmm. Uh, let's see. I'm not sure what happened, but I am not in the right place that I was. Should Here we go. I'm pulling through. Yeah. Uh, foreign entity, yeah. And it's an entity both. It can be used as to describe another country's business entity or another U.S. state entity. Through most of this, we're going to be talking about other state entities rather than foreign countries. So there's a requirement once your business is up and running, they're doing well and they want to move into other, other states. Well, they have to qualify if they are, quote, doing business. All of the states have statutes that state what doing business is, but they're not always very helpful. It can be something like um, having a bank account there, having board of directors meetings there, things of that nature that aren't as helpful as what you will have to do with a fact-specific inquiry. We also have a booklet at CT called What Constitutes Doing Business, and a lot of it is helpful because it's got case law, which a lot of this turns on since the statutes are so vague. So if you want to qualify, you file a foreign and document of qualification. Um, it's usually called a, a qualification or something like that. There are fees. And usually the state where you're qualifying wants to make sure in some way that you are in good standing in your home state. There's also compliance for this. Um, you cannot maintain a, a court case in state court unless you're in compliance. Um, this can happen. It's, it's usually a defense that's quickly raised by the defendant because it can get a case dismissed. Generally, the court will stay the proceeding and give the business entity opportunity to qualify, or they can litigate the issue of whether qualification is required or even perhaps if the defendant made a bad faith argument of that. So there's a few case laws on this as well. Um, Immobiliary Jeunesse Establishment, um, and I don't speak French, so I apologize if I offended anyone. Plaintiff was a foreign entity. It wasn't registered in Texas, um, but that entity itself brought a derivative suit against another corporation in which it owed stock. The defendants attained an order of abatement until the entity registered, and the entity then sought what was called an order of mandamus. Well, the court, the appellate court denied the mandamus, but upheld the abatement until the entity registered as a foreign entity. So it just slowed down the proceedings. It didn't have any effect on the result, but it cost money to do this. So this shows you why compliance is important. Um, a foreign entity doesn't want to be kicked out of a state. It doesn't want to have its rights taken away. And some individuals at times can be held liable if the action was knowing and willful. There's also post-qualification filing reports. Um, just like a corporation or a domestic LLC, they have to make changes if they make what's called a required change, such as change of agent, change of name, things of that nature. They have to report that to their foreign states as well. So if you have a corporation incorporated in Delaware, it changes its name, and that corporation was qualified in 42 states, it's likely that all 42 of those states will require some kind of name change amendment. And many of them will also require some kind of supporting document um, a certificate from the home state saying that that name actually changed. So again, compliance is important for all the reasons we've talked about and everything you can see here. There can be financial penalties. Um, and even though this has happened, if they're not compliant, they are still required to file their annual report, pay taxes, things of that nature. So if they want to leave, what they should do is file what's called an application for withdrawal. There's also transactional filings. This is just 
what causes the public record to be correct. It's where that corporation or LLC is, the t is where they are at that point in time. And they're filed in both domestic and foreign states. Again, compliance is important, financial penalties, delayed transactions. If you're not qualified or your merger hasn't gone through properly and it hasn't been filed, you may not be able to engage in a sale. So there can be serious negative consequences here as well. Here's a, a transaction case law lesson. Um, there was a wrongful death action filed against a corporation out of an accident in a plant in New York. But before that accident took place, the um, corporation defended, merged into its parent company, which was a Delaware corporation qualified to do business in New York. But the merger fought, was filed in Delaware, but they didn't properly file it in New York. So according to the New York Department of State, that was still an active corporation. Um, and they were required to file a county conveyance record of the plant. Um, and the defendant, the court held that that defendant, that what they thought to be a no longer existing corporation, could be held liable. And they rejected the arguments that due to the merger, it no longer existed or owned the plant. They said that because they didn't file their merger documents in New York, so in New York, they still appeared to be a separate company. Here's another one called Reddick. Um, a lawyer was retained to reinstate an administratively dissolved corporation. This is in relation to um, a trust and the establishment of a will and a few other things. Um, they tried to file the reinstatement of the corporation a few times, but they were rejected. This person was in this tax and estate planning lawyer. Apparently, he didn't know how to reinstate a corporation properly and the people from the trust and, and who were harmed sued him for malpractice. Well, the court did rule in favor of the defendant. They, they uphold the, uh, the trial's court ruling of summary judgment. So what does this tell us? Well, the lawyer was still sued for doing something wrong, and there could be a case down the road where the lawyer does something wrong like this, and the ending is not so good for him or her, and she has to pay malpractice fines. Another one is Friends of Shingle Springs Interchange. Um, in this, the corporation filed a, compli a complaint alleging that there had been two statutes that were violated. When they filed, the corporation's powers were suspended, so filing the complaint did not toll the statute of limitations. Later, they tried to revive the corporation, and this was rejected because failure to submit all the necessary documents. So they did a poor job trying to revive the corporation. By the time they did revive the corporation, the suit was dismissed. Um, the statute of limitations had expired. So during it had to be a long period of time that they were trying to revive this corporation. They did it improperly, and by the time it was done, the statutes had told. This is just a long list of how to ensure compliance, and it's how to make sure your filings are successful, unlike the previous people who were sued for malpractice. Now, here we go with the definition of compliance. Um, for the purpose of this seminar, all it means is state, federal, local statutes, all kinds of rules. Um, that require a business entity to take some kind of action and imposes penalties for a failure to do so. Affirmative actions could be include filing documents or, or reports um, and appointing or maintaining a registered agent. So this just goes again to why compliance is important. There's so many bad things that can happen. There's also compliance when it comes to internal corporate governance, and this is related to how the entity is governed. There are either statutory requirements or internal documents, for instance, such as the bylaws. Um, and corporations, due to the nature of the corporate law, have greater requirements than LLCs do. 
so record keeping is big. Um, they have to re retain certain books and records. And the statutes kind of vary, but tends to be the formation documents, amendments, the shareholder list, which is very important if the shareholders demand to see that list, meeting minutes, and recent tax returns and annual reports. Now there are inspection requirements when the shareholders seeking a list, what they have to prove, and if the court doesn't want to, get, if the corporation doesn't want to provide the documents, what their rebuttal is. But eventually, a business entity or will be can be taken to court by the shareholders who want that compliance enforced. There's also meeting requirements. Corporations are required to have an annual meeting, LLCs are not. Um, and there are other requirements for the meeting, such as a quorum, record date, voting, notice, um, and all of those things as well. And the benefit of the LLC is it's a little bit more loosely governed and this isn't required. These are some of the meeting requirements um, where they're held. This is just something to kind of look and, and to be aware of your meeting requirements. Most corporations like to put this information in the bylaw or leave it to the discretion of the directors. Indemnification has become a big issue over recent years. When is the business entity, when is it required to pay the expenses for liabilities incurred by managing officials if it's sued for actions taken in their official? capacity. We want good people to serve on boards of director and, and run LLCs, and they probably won't be doing that if they would be responsible for the liabilities of the company. Um, sometimes mandatory, uh, it can be mandatory, such as in the statutes, or it can be permissive. You can go further than that if you wish. Dissenters also have rights to appraisal to receive fair market value if the corporation is sold. But the shareholder has to do a few things. They have to own stock at the time the transaction took place and at the time the lawsuit was filed, and they could not have voted for the transaction to occur. If this is the case, the corporation can appraise the value of the stock um, if there's no agreement as to its fair market value. Now, this is only for smaller corporations. Any corporation that's publicly traded, there, the courts will not be involved because it's believed that the markets are the best determiner of the value of stock. So why is internal compliance important? Well, shareholders can sue if they don't have their rights provided for them. Um, Non-compliance with the operating agreement or bylaws, there can be suits for breach of contract. And it may be a factor, it's one of the factors if a court decides to pierce the veil taking away the shareholder or member protection. Um, this is new and this is important. It's called ratification of defective acts under the Delaware Code. Um, in the past, if a corporation issued more stock or did things that were invalid, all the court could tell them was whether the action was void or voidable. Well, this avoids this. Section 204, uh, it created a procedure where a corporation can ratify acts um, due to noncompliance with the corporate code, um, the certificate of incorporation, or the bylaws. They would be either Previously, they would have been void or voidable, but this allows the Chancery Court to ratify the acts. Um, one important ca uh, case that sort of outlines all this is called In Re Trupanian, um, and it demonstrates the, the thoroughness and approach of the Delaware Court. On April 1st, the day that this law became effective, this company and its CEO filed a petition for relief under Section 205. By April 28th, not even a month later, the court resolved this by issuing a final order. Um, what happened is this is they sought correction of what they thought was an innocent error that resulted in serious consequences. Trupanian was incorporated in Delaware in 2006. 
an employee in the accounting department decided he could save the corporation money in franchise taxes and reincorporate it in Arizona. Then the employee realized maybe that was a mistake and tried to reincorporate again in Delaware unsuccessfully. There was no shareholder vote and no board vote on this. And it left the company unable to determine which board was valid and which company was valid. Also, they didn't strictly handle written consents. Um, they weren't dated and there was no notice as the code requires. So this act was potentially invalid and it left in doubt the election of the directors. So there was a final court order where the court, first of all, disregarded the reincorporation in Arizona and back in Delaware and recognized the initial corporation as the valid existing entity. It confirmed the stock issuances were valid as they were done, and it determined that the board of directors was the correct board of directors and could be known as such. Well, there's other state compliance requirements as well. Um, and some of these are, they kind of vary. Some can be names. There's such a thing as, you know, there's unclaimed property, state security laws, and charitable solicitation. And failure to do this can result in pretty heavy penalties. So the assumed name statutes are important. Corporations and LLCs, they tend to value their name and they don't want someone else having that name, but they may, it may already be taken and they have to use an assumed name. Purpose of that is the public has to know who they are really dealing with. So you're required to file if you're operating under an assumed name. It usually just tells the public the name of the assumed name, the true name of the corporation or LLC behind that, the state of formation, and their principal place of business. Oftentimes these are filed with the county, and sometimes a publication is also required. Compliance is very important. Again, there may be statutory penalties. It can, it can be a criminal misdemeanor to operate under an assumed name without filing. Um, and so another party may be able to take the name. Um, so those are just some of the things you have to remember and why you'll need an assumed name filing. Then there's the unclaimed property laws. Every state has a law that requires holders of property to remit that property to the state and the state will eventually give it to the person, the true owner, um, or the property will escheat to the state. So the property holder has to report generally annually um, if they have certain property that they're holding. It can be real, it can be personal property or it can be finances, stock, bonds, things of that nature. But the corporation is also under, or the LLC is under an obligation to attempt to notify the true owner so they can rectify the situation. If they are unable to notify the true owner, then they turn that over to the state. Um, there can be a lot of penalties on that as well. Um, and this is just a Supreme Court case from 1993, it validated an earlier case in 1965 over where property went. Um, if the property was real or tangible, it was the state in which the property was located that had the priority. But what about intangible property such as stock or, or money or bonds? Well, first of all, they would go to the state of the owner's last known address um, as known by the holder. If there was no address, or they lived in a foreign country or in a state that didn't have an applicable statute, um, the unclaimed property would be reported to the holder state of formation. So you can see why compliance is important here. Um, holder failing to reply, file a report, there can be 12% of the value of the property, civil penalties, and if it's willful, um, it can be 25% of the property's value um, or a penalty of $1,000 per day up to $25,000 plus the 20% value of the property. So it can be very expensive if you fail to do this. There's also state charitable solicitation laws. They, most states want to protect their donors from fraud and they want charitable organizations to file with the state 
oftentimes the Attorney General or the Secretary of State, just so the state knows that they are soliciting money within the state. And this just gives you a little bit of the charitable solicitation law requirements. And there's also an annual financial reporting obligation. Uh, compliance is important with this as well. Um, you can get an injunction from the Attorney General for failing to file properly, and you may not be able to solicit business in that state again or for a long time. And this can be very harmful, especially if it's a legitimate charity or, or organization that they don't want their their name out there taken in a bad way. There's also a lot of federal compliance laws. Um, one of the biggest that I'm sure you're aware of is the security law. That's an example where federal compliance requirements involve the filing of reports and documents based on, based on the financial status of the entity. So uh, securities require a company, if it offers to sell securities to the public, they have to disclose certain business and financial information that will allow investors to have that information to make an informed decision. There's a lot of filing and forms required for this. Um, and it consists of various instruments, corporate stock, um, an LLC membership interest is not specifically listed, but the LLC is required to uh, comply with recording requirements if the interest is selling a, a constituent, what's called an investment contract. Um, and this is an old case. You may remember it from law school, the Howey case, and it defines what an investment contract is. And a lot of this depends, you know, this is where you may look for for an LLC. If you have a publicly traded LLC, it's it's a little easier to determine but if it's just a large LLC and it meets these requirements, then yeah, you will have to file with the Securities and Exchange Commission. And it goes down to, do the members who buy interests, is this, do they expect the income to be passive or will they expect to work for it or have it be more of a direct source of income? These are all the filings that are required. Um, you have to register. Also, there's an annual and quarterly report. If certain transactions take place, they have to file a current report to update it. Um, and there's just a lot of recordings and forms to file. So obviously, compliance is important for this. Uh, there can be liability to the purchaser who can recover um, interest and damages. Um, failure to file all those reports we just saw. The registration can be revoked by the SEC. Um, it can be failing to disclose a material fact that can also give rise to liability. Maybe whatever, um, wherever they are registered, that registration companies such as the NASDAQ can deny them their registration. And it certainly can affect their ability to um, what types of security offerings they may give to the public. So governance is also a key issue. Governance is part of compliance. It's the structure or the corporation or the LLC is managed and controlled and how power is allocated and decision making is made. So we will focus here on compliance related decisions and actions. Well, the basic governing structure of the corporation is that it's owned by shareholders who are limited in their liability, directors who oversee management, and then the officers who run the daily operations. So the basic governing structure for an LLC is a little different. Um, you can have it run by members or you can have it run and operated by managers. Um, you can have it look as much like a corporation or as much like a partnership as you wish. Well, first of all, the state enabling statutes have regulatory effect. There's internal documents such as the bylaws or the LLC operating agreement. 
Um, there's federal security laws, again, for public companies, such as uh, Sarbanes-Oxley, which I'm sure we know a lot about, and Dodd-Frank, and other reform and consumer protection laws. So there's a relationship between governance and compliance. There is a nexus. Um, a corporation or an LLC, any kind of business entity, it's, it's not a real person. It's an artificial entity. And actions are taken on behalf of the entity by the directors and officers or members and managers. Well, you have to have an individual at some point who is responsible for filing those reports. Um, or they may be in a position to detect or prevent some kind of wrongdoing or noncompliance. Um, and other parties that can see if something's going wrong are sometimes shareholders and often in-house counsel. So we're going to talk about the director's duty, whether an officer or director has personal liability, shareholder derivative suits, and are members, managers, are they treated the same as corporate owners and management? So here we are at how directors take part or relate to corporate governance. Um, there's a variety of sources that have directors accountable. Um, state laws generally do not regulate the board who is on it or their qualifications, although that can be in the bylaws. Um, the board can always form committees, generally optional under state laws. Um, Public corporations are now required by federal law to have an audit and a compensation committee, and there are requirements of who can compose that and what their abilities have to be. Um, also, again, SEC rules, that's not governmental, can regulate whether a corporation can be listed on a national exchange, um, and they can require a majority or a certain number of directors who are deemed independent. So the directors have two duties. They have the duty of loyalty and the duty of care. Loyalty um, puts the corporation and the shareholders' interests above their own interests, and this is where you avoid conflict of interest. The duty of care is to make properly informed decisions and be knowledgeable about the affairs of the corporation. Also, power and authority certainly can be delegated. Most of the statutes allow a board to delegate officers, employees, other parties, the authority to do things. Um, you could even implement, and this is not a, this is a good idea, a process to ensure that all the reports that we've talked about and filings are made. You can have a procedure, and you should, for executing and delivering documents and deciding whether qualification is required. That should be done by counsel. So directors really are the final monitor of compliance. Um, so they have a primary compliance-related role in that they oversee the monitoring and actions of the officers and the employees. Um, with the financial um, scandals of the past, directors were criticized for not knowing or not looking into enough um, the kind of actions that took place. Um, a 2003 tax force recommended that the statutes outline a public corporation's board of duty of oversight. Um, also, the model code issue has um, eight issues that a board should pay attention to as part of their oversight responsibility. These are called the care marks claims, and in this case, um, the plaintiffs shareholders alleged that the board breached its fiduciary duty of care for allowing unlawful management payments and references and referrals to doctors to be made. And in fact, the company was indicted by the Justice Department and entered a plea deal for $250 million. So these were what they were claiming was the wrongdoing of the director. The Chancery Court said in dicta, a board has to make a good faith effort to ensure the corporation has an information and reporting system to provide them with timely and accurate information so that they can make an informed judgment regarding compliance issues. 
Um, the claim was that directors should be held liable for the harm done to the corporation because they were not compliant. Um, it was based on the arguments that directors failed to oversee the actions of the responsible officers and employees. So it was mostly a shareholder derivative suit, and many of these are brought to the Chancery Court every year. Another case on this matter is called Stone versus Ritter. And this expands the duty of loyalty, and it confirms the existence of the duty of oversight. Um, the plaintiff shareholders allege that the board allowed employees to violate reporting requirements and that they were operating what they said amounted to a Ponzi scheme in violation of federal law, banking law, et cetera. Well, the bank announced that it had entered um, a entered into an agreement with the Justice Department where it would pay $50 million in fines and civil penalties. So the shareholders objected to this, saying that the corporation's directors were in breach of their duty. Um, and the directors were held liable because they utterly failed to implement any kind of reporting system. Um, once implementing a system, it consciously failed to monitor or oversee the operation, destabilizing, disabling themselves from informed information. And the court said that there are red flags and they cannot be ignored, um, such as failing to appoint or convene an auditing committee. That would be what the court would refer to as utter failure. And the duty of oversight is seen as a duty, a subset of the duty of loyalty. This can't be exculpated in the bylaws or in the formation documents of the corporation. So there were more Caremark claims. And in this case, the court said, um, the liability requires showing that the directors knew they were not discharging their duty. Um, a mere fact that the corporation was not in legal compliance wasn't sufficient. Um, Stone affirmed these dismissal claims. Um, the corporation was fined for failing to file reports under the Bank Secrecy Act, those, that um, cause of action that I just mentioned. Um, but the board established a system to permit monitoring and compliance but the system failed. But even though the system failed, the board had discharged its oversight duty. Um, there was another case following Caremark called Citigroup, um, the shareholder's derivative lawsuit. And this was pretty interesting as well. The corporation, again, paid billions in fines and settlement fees. And the shareholders claimed the board failed to monitor the risk of these investments. It was mortgage-backed securities. The Chancery Court dismissed. The board had put in a procedure of controls to monitor the risk, um, and they had an audit and risk committee. Um, so again, they said even though the system failed and they owed billions, um, they acted in good faith, so obviously they were not in breach. Officers also play a role in governance and compliance. Um, there are state corporate officers. This is defined in the state law. Um, it can also be in the bylaws or whatever uh, a corporation wishes to define it. Federal security laws are a little bit more specific and they have certain obligations um, on officers and signing of documents. For um, CEO and the CFO have to certify certain reports so that requires them to have the information. Um, officers' duties, they can be statutory, or they can be imposed by the court. Um, in 2009, in the Gentler case, the court held that it explicitly held that co corporate officers owe fiduciary duties that are identical to those owed by corporations, to corporate directors. Now, we always believe that to be the case, but it was definitely helpful when this was stated by the Supreme Court of Delaware. So officers do play a, a great role in compliance. They usually appoint the employees who are responsible, um, and sometimes that can lead to personal responsibility, personal liability 
if a corporation is found to be noncompliant. There's some statutory liability. Um, one is the Hart Scott Rodino Act, that this is a pre merger notification of the Department of, of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission. And under the Act, any person or officer, et cetera, who consummates a merger without filing the pre merger notification report can be liable. Also, California security laws and even the Re Internal Revenue Code provides for personal liability for, quote, the responsible persons, and there's a lot of case law and decisions on, quote, responsible persons, when the corporation fails to comply with the tax laws. And then there's the responsible corporate officer doctrine. This is an old common law theory, when an officer could be held liable when the corporation failed to comply with the law. Um, there's an old uh, United States case, Supreme Court, 1943, and they said if an officer was in a position to prevent the statutory violations in the first place or corrected them, could correct them and failed to do so, the officer can be held liable for pe penalties. Now, this originally came from food and drug safety laws, but it, it's been applied elsewhere and expanded to other liability under a variety of federal and state laws. Um, and this just tells you what it is. Um, the officer has to be in a position of responsibility so that they could influence the corporation's policies or activities, and that becomes a, a factual statement. Um, the officer's position, they could have influenced it, they could have done something, and that their action or fail to do so facilitated these violations. Um, this is a case law example where it's a state case law. In Washington, there was a case where um, one of the parties, someone who oversaw and controlled a facility, failed to follow proper procedure for disposing of dangerous waste. So he violated the dangerous waste law. Um, and the court upheld his, um, they said that the statute wasn't required to show he engaged in wrongful conduct, so he didn't have to you know, pour the waste into the river himself. Um, they had to show that the defendant, by reason of the position in the company, had responsibility and authority to prevent it or to correct it, and that the defendant exercised they determined, and it was a qual requirement, um, had significant control over the operations of the facility. So McNamara was assessed penalties for noncompliance with the state's Hazardous Waste Management Act. He didn't have to pour poison in the river by himself. Then we have some interesting things on shareholder governance, but I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Um, as I mentioned, this is a long seminar, and I was just going to try to give you the best of the best. I'm going to look a little bit at how LLC managers and members handle governance. It's harder to find than for corporate directors, that's for sure, because the LLC is a flexible entity. Um, it, it has to have an operating agreement, which may not even be required to be in writing, and there's certainly a lack of precedent. Um, the flexibility is one of the things that makes the LLC so attractive. Um, so we don't know what all the requirements are or who per se would be responsible for certain things. And there's lack of precedent in interpreting the LLC statutes. You know, they've been around for 25 years in Delaware where corporations have been around for, you know, 200 years. So the operating agreement can regulate what management must do. Um, you can have provisions for meeting, voting, record dates, anything that you want to have as a requirement. 
And it's just known in Delaware that the Delaware policy is to give the maximum effect to the principle of freedom to contract and to have the operating agreement enforceable. So members and managers, um, it's difficult to say what generally, what kind of impact they have on governance. Maybe someone who's very aware could say that certain things aren't done and have to be done, but not everyone is, knows what these compliance related tasks are, and you can have a variety of people that are responsible. Um, but the members have a few rights. They elect managers, and just like a shareholder of a corporation, they have the right to file a derivative suit. Um, so member managers, if you're a member manager and a manager, the only people here that get off are members who are uh, members of a member of a manager managed corporation uh, LLC. If you're a member of one of these manager managed LLCs, your liability is, is like that of a stockholder. You can only lose up to the amount that you have invested. You aren't responsible for the, the contracts or the negligence of the LLC itself. Um, the issue becomes, um, can these managers or members be personally liable along with the LLC? Um, some statutes provide that. Um, there may be some kind of common law liability, like the RCO Act that we just discussed. But again, lack of precedent makes this hard to determine. And there are some cases where the LLC violated the Massachusetts Wage Act. They probably did that deliberately, and they were subject to civil and criminal penalties. The plaintiff um, filed suit against the employer, the LLC, and two of its managers. Well, the Wage Act imposes liability on any one person with an employee, president and treasurer of a corporate employer, or officers or agents having the management of the corporate employer. So the trial court dismissed the suit against the managers on the ground that this Massachusetts Wage Act doesn't impose individual liability on LLC managers. So it, it was written at a time where there were mostly corporations, and that's what the law thought of. The Supreme Court reversed. Um, they did say an LLC manager can be liable um, if he meets the criteria of control, direction, participation in policy. Um, the inclusion of corporate officer liability pr provisions show a legislative intent to hold individuals with authority liable and any other interpretation they said would be at odds with the intent of the act, which is to prevent employees. Now, some state courts have come to the opposite conclusion. They have said if it doesn't apply to an LLC, then it's up to the legislature to make that change, and they won't just look at the intent of the act in general. So now I'm going to push ahead a little bit more and... I believe we have our final polling question. We are going to talk about regulated industries now. And would you say the clients you have are in heavily reg regulated industries, such as um, perhaps insurance, medical devices, things of that nature? Let's give our attendees a moment here again for the CLE accreditation to answer this polling question. And the answer is, of course, being yes, yes, but infrequently, and no. And the question, are your clients in a heavily regulated industry? I imagine everybody's answered now. Tamara, you can push forward and see what the answer, results are. Um, okay. 48% uh, yes, 15% infrequently, and 36% no. 
And I think, you know, what you've seen with all these required regulations, there's a lot just beyond the industry the, the business entity is in. And these are just an example of some things that are regulated by state government, oftentimes, and federal too, um, alcohol, tobacco, transportation, mortgage broker services, and insurance. So I just want to, at this point, it's 1 o'clock. We start on time and end on time. And this just gives you a recap of what we talked about. I, we went through a lot of material today, and I appreciate you sticking with me on this. And I am going to turn things over to Amanda and Victor. Thank you, Tamara, and thank you, everyone, for joining today's webinar. We're going to quickly go through our CLE questions. In the event that you're not able to answer these CLE polling questions, you'll need to download the CLE survey, which is located in the upper left-hand corner of your screen under the resource list. We'll go ahead and begin our CLE questions. First question, please rate today's webinar. Again, if you are seeking CLE, we do need you to stay on and answer these questions. We'll go ahead and move on to the second polling question for CLA. Please rate the overall quality of today's webinar, one being the lowest and five being the highest. Moving along to CLA question number three, please rate the written materials of today's webinar one being the lowest, and five being the highest. Our last CLE polling question, please rate today's instructor, one being the lowest, five being the highest. This does conclude today's webinar. We do thank everyone for joining today. There are several questions that came in during the presentation today that we were not able to get to. We will get those over to the presenter, and they'll be sent out in a thank you email, which will be sent out by our CT team. We'll go ahead and close the polling question. And I've got the housekeeping notes on there just in case you needed to get the email address to email in your um, sign-in sheet if you participated as a group or if you need to complete the evaluation survey, I've also um, got that listed there too. And that resource list, which is in the upper left-hand corner, you can download today's presentation along with Tamara Kling's speaker bio. You can also download the sign-in sheet if you participate as a group, but you are not an attorney in Indiana, Louisiana, Nevada, Pennsylvania, or Ohio. We'll need you to get that sent in so that we can get you on the attended list. And if you did participate as a group, you will need to also download the CLE survey if you're seeking CLE and fill that out and email that over to cls-clecredit at walterscore.com. This does need to be completed within the next 24 hours and sent over to us. CLE certificates, upon completion of the webinar today, you'll receive a certificate of participation, which you will receive within one week. If you're seeking CLA credit in the states of California, New York, or New York, your certificate will be sent to you in 30 days. Please make note of these dates. California and New York, you will get your certificates within 30 days. All certificate of participation will be sent out within the following this week. Again, we thank you for joining today's webinar. If you have any last-minute questions that you would like to ask the presenter, please submit them in the Q&A box, which is located in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. We'll go ahead and leave this call up until about 10 after, so we give you just a little bit more time to get everything downloaded. You will also receive the presentation materials and the thank you um, email that will go out with your certificate of partic participation. Again, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules and joining our webinar today. Thank you, Tamara, for presenting.
for those of you that are still submitting your questions that you would like to ask the presenter, we will still continue to take them in until we close the webinar out today. We'll make sure that those get over to the speaker so that she can get those answered for you. And they, everyone's questions that were answered will actually be sent out within our thank you email. Again, CLE Certificate of Participation will be sent to you within a week. And if you are seeking CLE in California or New York, your certificate will be sent to you within 30 days of today's webinar. If you should still have a question that you'd like to ask the presenter that you didn't get to do during the presentation today, please submit them in the Q&A box in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. Also in the upper left-hand corner of your screen, you'll notice that there is a resource list. This resource list will have our speaker bio, today's presentation slide. If you participated as a group, you'll need to fill out the sign-in sheet and email that back to us, along with the CLE survey if you were not able to answer the CLE via the slide deck. Or if you participated as a group, you'll need to download that and send that in in order to receive CLE. That form must be filled out and sent back in within 24 hours of today's webinar. Again, we thank you for attending today's webinar presented by Tamara Kling, Government Relations and Regional Attorney for CT. Thank you so much, and we will go ahead and conclude this call today. Have a fantastic day.